welcome to the At Peace Parents podcast. I'm Casey, and I'm here to empower you in your decision making as a parent of a demand avoidant child. My goal is to share insights that will generate aha moments and support your connection with your child. I'm a mom of two amazing little boys, one of whom is PDA, and I've worked with hundreds of parents just like you to teach them how to lead their child out of burnout and find the clarity, peace, and sense of community they need. Declarative language be used as a tool to support PDA children and teens. So if you're a parent and you are new to this concept of declarative language, or you have tried using declarative language with your PDA child or teen, but it hasn't, in air quotes, worked, then this mini free training on declarative language is just for you. So welcome. So today we're going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to review the six questions that were submitted from our parent community on declarative language. We're going to talk about what it is and how it can be helpful for our PDA children and teens. Then we're going to talk about the primary place that parents get stuck when trying to apply this great tool with PDA children and teens. I'll tell you some tips for applying it to a pda -er three ways we can use it to support them as a conversation starter, as an auditory cue or reminder, and as an auditory strew or offering, which can support executive functioning. And then I'm gonna give you 10 starter scripts with examples. And then I hope to have time to at, answer the one of the questions about how to communicate to a school about using this declarative language tool. Okay, so what is it? What is declarative language? So the best book I have to recommend to understand this simply is called The Declarative Language Handbook by Linda K. Murphy. Okay, so essentially it is a style of speaking to your child or teen that is somewhat indirect instead of asking direct questions or using imperatives. What's an imperative? An imperative is like, a command kind of like let's go or it's time to go put your shoes on let's go outside direct questions would be do you want to go outside did you put your shoes on okay so that's how most of us are used to talking <laughs> asking questions to our kids or those around us or giving them commands right but for a pda child or teen or even just a sensitive child or a neurodivergent child with a sensitive threat response, this can activate that survival part of the brain, which is in red here behind me, and shut down communication. Why? The root cause of what tells the PDA child or teen's nervous system, hey, you're in danger or there's a life threat, is the neuroception, so the subconscious perception around a loss of autonomy, freedom and choice, or equality. So how does asking a question or using an imperative take away their autonomy and equality? Let's take an example. If I say to my son, Cooper, how did you sleep, right? Which is a very normal way of trying to connect and start a conversation, right? When he comes down in the morning, he subconsciously perceives I'm putting myself above him in a position of authority and deciding to ask the question without him initiating, right? So this is happening on a subconscious level. This is the neuroception of the neurotype that we're talking about. So one of the things as parents we can do as an accommodation to support our kids is we can start practicing this different way of speaking. And I will say that when I first started to learn this and practice it using this book, I would sometimes just stand there in front of my son and like no words could come out because it was so awkward for me to speak like this because I'm used to asking people how they're doing, what they ate, you know, that's a way of connecting to people. But we're shifting how we connect and support our PDA child or team. Okay, so let's first review the six questions that were submitted from the community this week. And I am going to do my best to touch on each of these within the content. 
Okay, so the questions from the community are, what is it, which I just answered, any go-to phrases, I try to use declarative language but find it tough to come out organically, absolutely, how to ask about something specific in a declarative way, for example, did XYZ happen today, the next question is, is declarative language different for teens versus young children? Fifth, how to use declarative language in regards to boundaries and the best way to explain to the school team, can you please use declarative language? Okay, so we're going to try and get to all of these. And yes, I am going to give very concrete examples. I'm just situating us in what this is and why it's important. Let's talk about some concrete examples. So for example, my son has a hard time eating right? And it was a huge source of stress for me as a parent. So I would often ask him to eat what was on his plate, like, hey, can you finish your apples? That's an imperative. Or will you please finish your apples before you have dessert, right? That's a question. So in addition to the fact that I'm trying to control subtly and rightfully as a parent, the outcome, like I want him to eat the apples, he from the imperative, eat your apples, or the question, did you eat your apples, is perceiving threat. And that's going to actually make him less likely to eat because it's like mobilizing his nervous system, right? And it's shutting down communication. So when I first started using declarative language, I would try and use declarative language in order to make him eat, right? I notice that your apple is still on your plate. However, that doesn't work for a PDA kid either because they're perceiving the energy behind the declarative statement trying to make them eat. Okay, so we have to adjust this tool to be supportive of the PDA's nervous system. So that is the primary place that parents get confused. When they're using a declarative statement, they're trying to use it to elicit information, change the behavior, or control the behavior in the moment. Okay, and what do we know about having the energy around trying to control outcomes or have expectations of how they respond to something with a PDA child or teen, it doesn't go well because it neurocepts as a loss of their freedom and choice. So for example, declarative language is often thought about as like, I use it to set a boundary, right? Like in the gentle parenting space, it's like, I'm not gonna let you touch my body like that. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, But the expectation in the gentle neurotypical parenting space is that saying that declarative sentence is going to stop the behavior. That's not how it works for a PDA kid or teen. So for example, like if my son drops a Twix wrapper on the floor because he's just taken out a snack, eaten the chocolate and dropped on the floor, this is declarative. I noticed that you didn't pick up your Twix wrapper, but that doesn't mean he's going to do it. Okay, and in fact, it might make it less likely that he's going to do it if the energy around what I'm declaring is I'm doing this in order to get you to pick up the Twix wrapper. Or an example I saw recently of, you know, a teen whose room is messy. So you come in and you say, I noticed you made your bed, but I also saw that there's some, you know, dirty clothes in the corner of the closet, period. Two declarative sentences. And that's fine, but I think we've looked at this as a solution to make the teen clean it up. And that's not going to work with a PDA child or teen. Okay, so how do we use it? How do we use this tool to support connection, to support executive functioning, and to be a tool in our toolkit of accommodation for overall cumulative nervous system activation to come down? So first, there are three ways that I want you to think about using this. The first is for connection and communication, which is as a conversation starter. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Second, as an auditory cue. Okay, what does that mean? Like you're saying a sentence that's declarative that they can hear, and it's either a reminder 
or a cue for them. For example, I could use the declarative sentence of, I noticed you didn't eat your apples, just as a reminder, like, hey, you got distracted on your iPad and you forgot to eat, right? But I'm coming at it with an energy of non-attachment of just like, hey, I noticed you didn't eat your apples, right? Rather than being like, I'm going to use this declarative sentence in order to get him to eat his apples. And this nuance is why you're getting stuck if you've tried this, okay? The third way is as an auditory strew or offering. So this is like, you may have noticed that your child, for example, your teen says things like, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, but they can't come up with ideas and then they reject yours. So this is one of the ways we can use declarative language, okay? I'm also gonna talk about how to think about it when setting a boundary. So the importance here is like, a boundary is what you do in response to a situation. You control your own behavior, not the PDAers, right? So this is an example of when I might use it as a boundary. My PDA son is like destroying my younger son's things. My boundary is that I get up and I move with my younger son to a different place. And I might say, it's not okay to destroy your brother's things. But here's the kicker. I'm not saying it with the expectation that Cooper will stop. I'm saying it in order to signal to my younger son the values of our family and that I've recognized that this is not okay. Okay, this may sound like splitting hairs, but this is gonna be the difference between this being an effective tool and it being a tool that you get frustrated with because you're looking at it as like a magic bullet to change your child's behavior, okay? So let's talk about how we can use it. So as a conversation starter, so for example, many parents that I work with have PDA children or teens who especially as they near burnout or are in burnout, largely stop communicating with anyone around them and or can be selectively mute or simply not speak to their parent, right? Which is very, very distressing, especially if you're witnessing troubling behaviors like, you know, they're increasingly restricting their eating or they're not leaving their room for, you know, weeks at a time or they're like increasingly seeming very activated after school, but we can't get the information out of them about like, what happened? Do you have friends? Like what's going on with your teacher, right? So one of the ways that we can use declarative language is as a conversation starter that's not question oriented or imperative oriented. So for example, let's say I'm coming into a situation where like I'm hanging out with a friend who also has a PDA kid, right? My tendency before making a paradigm shift was definitely to go up to the kid and be like, hey, how are you doing? Do you want to go on the swings with me? Like, are you having a good day? Because I wanted the kid to be, feel comfortable. But that's going to activate and shut down communication for the PDA. -er. So we can say a declarative sentence, like maybe you notice the kid has a red shirt with a Thomas the Train. And you could say, oh my gosh, I'm wearing a red shirt too right? So you're just making a declarative sentence that's out there in front of them that they can respond to or not, right? So it's much more of an invitation for conversation and connection, but it also like is a practice of non-attachment on the part of the parent because maybe they're like, stop talking, or I don't want to talk about this, or they growl, right? And that's what used to happen to my son. So it's almost like a little trial air balloon of like, I see you, there's this point of connection. If they want to engage, they can. If they don't, that's fine too. Okay, or maybe like you're noticing as the kids have gone back to school or the teens that, you know, there's a lot of agitation after school, but you have no idea what's going on. You can't get information out. Like our tendency is to want to fix it in the moment, right? What happened at school? Is everything okay? Let's talk about this, right? So one of the things we can do if we have school on our mind is to use a declarative sentence as a conversation starter in a moment of connection and calm, right? So maybe it's like, 
you know, when they're on their iPad and sort of like zoning a little bit, but not like focused on something. Or maybe it's like right before bed when they are more open to conversation. Or maybe it's in a car ride, which regulates them, but not to and from school, but like maybe to do a preferred activity. So we might say, and this is indirect, right? We're using declarative language. When I was in school, when I was 12, I had this teacher I really didn't like, period. Declarative sentence. And then we wait, we see, right? We collect the next piece of data, which is either like, they say nothing, which doesn't mean that that sentence didn't get in, right? It just means they're not ready to respond. And you may find, and this happens, you plant that seed of when I was in school and I was 13, I had a teacher I really didn't like, period. They say nothing or say stop talking. But two weeks later, they come back to you and be like, I don't really like my teacher either. Right? But it's totally out of context. It's not in the conversation that you thought you were having. But they're circling back with the autonomy and timeline that they're ready for. Okay? Another one like that I used this week, right, where I'm very anxious this week because it's my son's first week back in fourth grade. Just like you, I often feel like the other shoe can drop at any moment, right? And my son has had a mobilized nervous system, that fight flight mobilization because he's so excited and because it's new and there's losses of autonomy and like things he can't control. And so he's been vomiting at night because that's what the body does when it needs to expel fluids and efficiently run away from the lion, right? This is a nervous system disability. This is what happens as a causal mechanism. Every part of my mama heart wants to like monitor and control and fix and make sure he's sleeping and get all the information. But as soon as I try and ask him or, you know, tell him he needs to tell me, it shuts down communication. So what can we do? We can strew or like put into the environment a conversation starter like, oh, I slept pretty well last night. And I might say it to my husband, right? I slept pretty well last night, period. It's not even to him. It's just a declarative sentence about sleeping. And then I can see if he comes over to engage in the conversation or not right? So this is how, these are the like concrete steps that I had to take in order to reestablish communication with my son through and post burnout. So very indirect, right? And maybe the declarative sentence isn't even oriented towards them, right? So there's two more ways we can use it as an auditory cue, Auditory just meaning like it's sensory input through the ears, (laughs) hearing, listening, or an auditory offering. So I spoke earlier about the difference between using the sentence, I notice you didn't eat your apple, to with the energy behind it of eat the apple versus I truly noticed you didn't eat your apple. You know, I'm wondering if you're still hungry, right? And it's like you're not attached to whether he eats the apple, but you know that he gets distracted or your child gets distracted or gets hyper-focused on what they're doing and they don't eat it. So it's a cue. It's like a executive functioning support of like, hey, you know, you can still eat this apple, right? Another one might be like me wandering around the kitchen and being like, like, I know he might need his sweatshirt, but like, I'm not sure if he wants it at school, but I don't want to directly ask him or say, hey, do you want a sweatshirt? It might be cold or get your sweatshirt in your backpack. So instead, I might say a declarative sentence as I'm walking around the kitchen and just be like, oh, I can't find your sweatshirt, period, declarative sentence. That gives him an auditory cue that he can choose to respond to or not but I'm not activating his nervous system because I'm not directly giving him an imperative or the demand of a question that he has to respond to. He might shout from the living room, mom, I don't need a sweatshirt. And I'm like, yes, I got the information, (laughs) got some information. Or, oh, it's in here. Or I left it up in my room. Or increasingly, like, he'll go find it. But I have to have the energy around, like, he might not respond to this. 
And that's okay. It's an offering or an auditory cue. Okay. So other ways we can think about this is like, as an offering for information, like when they're like, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. And so you might be thinking like, you know, one way you can use declarative language is like, you can go to the water park, but that might be too direct even for the PDA or especially depending on how much nervous system activation they had. You might wait five minutes and then you're around, like maybe you're looking at your phone And you're like, oh, I saw that the water park is open, right? So you're just like giving that offering into the ether that they can respond to or not. Oh, I want to go to the water park or no, I don't like that idea. But you're reducing the nervous system activation. Okay, another one is when I see my son not eating, I have a tendency to be like, what can I get you for breakfast? Or like, what do you want to eat? But An offering might just be like, I can grab you a buffet for breakfast, or I can get you some pepperoni, right? So it's just an offering of what I can do, and then he can respond to it or not, right? Okay, so how do we actually implement this? So I wrote down 10 starter scripts to support you. And they're not complete scripts. You have to like add something on, but these are the types of phrases that you can use to start a declarative sentence as you start practicing. Okay, so I I notice, I notice. It could be, you know, I noticed that it was really cool outside last night. Just an observation, right? And maybe you're just making your thoughts explicit. So there's an opportunity for a response and engagement. And we do this with non-attachment. I wonder, I wonder if I should put this sweatshirt upstairs or fold it here, right? Like if I'm wondering, are they going to need their sweatshirt on their way outside of the house or do they like it in their closet? I'm excited to, right? So you're just sharing your experience. This is another example of a conversation starter. Maybe it's fall here in the United States and one of the things I get excited about is like going to apple orchards with my kids, right? So I'm like, I'm excited to go to an apple orchard, right? And maybe he's like, oh, let's go next weekend. And then all of a sudden we we have an activity that he's not avoiding that's going to give him dopamine. A way you can incorporate humor is using a declarative sentence to name something funny or self-deprecating that just happened. Like, oh, I just forgot to do X, or I just tripped over that crack in the sidewalk. Silly mama, right? So you're subtly putting yourself below them in terms of being like a perfect adult authority. And that regulates the PDA nervous system because when when you are equal to or above them in their neuroception, it's gonna activate that threat response and shut down communication and connection. Other ones I love are you can. For example, walking around, being aimless, starting to equalize against the brother because there's boredom. So I might notice that and just say like, you can head outside on the trampoline if you want, or like you can play with Lucas, our German au pair, for example. I can, that example of like, I can grab you some pepperoni, or I can grab a towel to wipe that up when they maybe spill and get activated. So we have, I notice, I wonder, I'm excited to, I just, you can, I can, we can. We can make our own rules right? If they're feeling overwhelmed by playing a certain game and they're getting activated, we can make our own rules. We can do it however you want. It's okay. I like, I dislike. So personally sharing your preferences as a conversation starter. I remember when maybe you're planting a seed for a conversation two weeks later that has to do with a topic of conversation that you really wanna have with your kid, but like can't because they just shut you down every time. I remember when, and you're, you're sharing your own experience in relation to the topic of conversation that you're hoping to have. And then another one is observation. It seems like. 
So there's a way we can do it indirectly using the tool, or there's a way we can be more direct, which is using a nonviolent communication script. Okay, so the, the first one is the following. This is a language tool for all children and teens with learning differences and disabilities. Then provide the book or the reference. We have noticed that declarative language really supports John's engagement, period right? So you're not like use declarative language for PDA because then you get into a space where you're arguing about whether PDA exists. We just want to say this is for children with learn or teens and children with learning differences or disabilities to help engagement, period. So they could have ADHD, they could be autistic, they could have dyslexia, whatever it is, it applies. So just get out of the trying to convince or argue about PDA and just say this is supportive. <laughs> the other way we could do it is more direct. And so I did a live on the tool of the Plato framework, which is person, location, action, timing, and object for making a very concise direct request which someone can say no to, they can say no but and offer a different solution, or they can say yes. But we're getting more data on how receptive they are. So one example I have is, would it be possible for the gym teacher to read the declarative language handbook before the next gym class on September 12th? Okay, so the person is the gym teacher, the location is at school, action is reading the book, the time is before next gym class on the 12th and the object is the book itself. Okay, so those are two ways that you can effectively communicate with your school about using this tool. And I have found in the work that I've done that schools are actually quite receptive to this because it is generally helpful for a lot of children who are demand avoidant for other reasons than a nervous system disability or are sensitive or shy, and it allows for more invitation and offering in the communication style. So I am going to wrap us up with this mini free training on declarative language. I don't get a commission or anything for recommending this book. I just recommend things that I actually find helpful <laughs> so that, you know, you don't feel like I'm only doing it because someone paid me because they're not. I really do think it's a good it's a good tool. So I hope this is helpful to all of you. I hope you I hope that this grounds some of it. All right, my friends, see you soon. Thanks everyone for being here with me at the At Peace Parents podcast. This is your source for all things related to understanding, supporting, accommodating, and advocating for your PDA child. To go deeper on any of these topics, check out my course offerings and masterclasses at the website www.atpeaceparents.com. To completely transform the way you think about and relate to your child and to bring peace and stability to your home, join us for the next cohort of the Paradigm Shift program.